the archetype does shine through the woman. It's real, but the, the individual part is real too. And unless the guy is capable of differentiating the archetype into that actual woman, the woman won't have anything to do with him. Or maybe she'll play with him like a spider plays with a fly. And it serves him right, too. But, but so you have to have both, you know. And so that's partly why, remember Sleeping Beauty? The Disney movie, you know how the, the hero was put into a castle by the evil queen, right? And then Sleeping Beauty is sleeping. And so then he has to fight his way through this archetypal representation, which actually transforms itself into the dragon of chaos. He has to fight his way all through all of that before he can actually get to the real woman. And that's exactly what happens with men as they develop, or fail to develop, is the first thing, to the degree that they're immature, all they see is the archetype. And they're very inferior in relationship to the archetype, because unless they were Christ, so to speak, you know, they're going to be, at, they're going to be on their knees. And so, to contend with the archetype means, first of all, to elevate the male, because as he contends with it, he develops, right? But it, and it also means to, to, but to place the two at equality, and then the, the archetype turns into the individual woman. Now, that's a big sacrifice, because, you know, hypothetically, you'd rather have Sleeping Beauty, the pretend princess, than some actual woman with all her trouble. But the problem is, there isn't Sleeping Beauty, the pretend princess. There's just the real woman. And you see that in Peter Pan, too, the story, because he's got Tinkerbell, and that's fine, except Tinkerbell's a fairy, and they don't exist. So he could have Wendy if he would grow up, but he doesn't want to grow up, so he's not going to get Wendy. He's just going to stay king of the bloody lost boys, and that'll be the end of that. So, so it's differentiation of the archetype, and that's what you're doing as you develop across time. Now, there's a book called The Origins and History of Consciousness, which was written by a guy named Eric Neumann. And it's a book that's very much like Maps of Meaning, because I believe that Maps of Meaning has been written four times. Um, it's Symbols of Transformation, Jung wrote that. It's Origins and History of Consciousness. Um, Eric Neumann, who was a student of Jung, wrote that. And it's also Becker's Denial of Death. And it's because, you know, when there's elements in Heidegger that are very similar, it's because of all... That's all working on the same problem, but one of the things that's lovely about Neumann, he's very smart about this, is he describes the acquisition of knowledge as the differentiation of the archetypes. And that's brilliant, it's right, it's like the thing itself is a unified whole, that's sort of the divine ground of reality. Then it fragments into the first three layers, masculine, feminine, and, and, and child. And then that fragments, and hopefully what it does is fragments right down to the level of individuals, so that when you're interacting with someone, you're interacting to their, with their individual expression of the archetypal reality. Because then you're actually at interacting with the person, and that'll get you a lot farther in any kind of relationship than being blown over by the archetype. So you can project archetypes, but they can also possess archetypes? I don't think you project them. Okay. It's not like you have a choice. It's that's how you see the world. It's the default. Because a projection implies that you could be doing something else. It's like everything you see is an archetype. Although some of them are more differentiated. And they can become extremely differentiated insofar as you actually know, come to know a person. You know, if you're really lucky, you differentiate the damn thing down to the level of individual recognition. And you're so skilled at that that the archetypal reality reestablishes itself. And then you get to have your cake and eat it too. Okay, so one of the things you you conceptualized marriage, because you know marriage is a human universal, by the way, something to think about. You know, so it, it looks like it's built into us pretty hard at a biological level. So there's variations, obviously, and there's a, there's the there are certain attractions in polygamy, especially for men. But all things considered, no matter where you look in the world, there's generally an attempt by the culture to sacralize a man-woman pair. Now, Jung was trying to figure out why the hell that would be. And I mean, there's the biological necessity, obviously. You've got to raise kids somehow, and there shouldn't just be one of you. But you don't want to just reduce everything down to the, you know, to the level of two rats living together, even though that's an important level. You know, he said that one of the things that's really useful about a vow is that you can't run away from the damn thing if it's an actual vow. So what you're supposed to do when you marry someone is you say, look, I'm stuck with you, 
and we're going to bet on this because we only get five shots at it anyways, and you know, you're the least awful person I've come across, and so let's tie ourselves together so we can't escape and see what happens. And so then you think, if you take that seriously, you think, oh my god, I'm stuck with this damn person for the rest of my life. Well, so then what do you do? If you really can't escape, you think, well, we better build something out of this, you know, because we're stuck in it. And so Jung conceptualized the marriage as an alchemical container, and he derived this from his studies on alchemy, where two opposite substances were placed together in a container they could not escape from, and then exposed to heat. And the heat's the relationship, obviously, and all the emotions that the relationship generates. They're exposed to heat, and they can't get out of the damn container. And what happens? Well, there's a transmutation. And the transmutation is a consequence of the exchange of information. So, and we know this works at a biological level. Because if we split your DNA down the middle and match it with something that's exactly the same, wherever there's a weakness, the two weaknesses are going to combine, and you're going to end up with offspring that are all mucked up. You know, that's basically a consequence of inbreeding. So what you want to do is you want to take your flawed genetic substance, which is you know 99.9 percent .9 good, and someone else's flawed genetic substance, and snap them together and hope like hell that the errors don't match up. And they probably won't. And so that's what you're doing in a relationship. It's like, you know, you're screwy in some way you can't fix, and so is the other person. And so you slap those two things together, and you hope that out of that, you build a totality. Okay, and that starts the information flow moving. So then the question is, what would you do if the information flow was curative? What would happen to you? So let's say you're 20% warped, which, if, which if the case would be pretty good, you know. And your partner's 20% warp too, but luckily your warps don't match up. What that means, if you listen to each other over a long enough period of time, if you really communicated, then you wouldn't be warped anymore, and neither would the other person, and then you'd have the archetypal situation as well as the individual situation. Right? You see what I mean? Because you both have been elevated up to the point where you're not full of holes anymore. And you think, well, that's part of the purpose. Insofar as there's a psychological and spiritual function of marriage, that's it. And so you can, you can have freedom. You can say, well, this is a knot that we can untie. But the problem with that is you don't have to contend with it. It's a good thing if it happens. You live longer. 
You have a better life. It's a better situation for your children. It's like everybody wins in that situation.